Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Podcast Pasta. That's a podcast that's like pasta, not the podcast that's about pasta. As always, I'm your host, Mike. And for today's topic, I want to discuss kind of um, not necessarily a new dilemma in fighting games, but rather I think a dilemma that is becoming more prominent, especially as like modern fighting games kind of embrace not only uh, their single player like story you know single player story modes but also kind of a linearity in their stories uh basically having one game kind of follow into the other and that is this whole concept of how these uh franchises handle um like death and in general like an aging cast of characters so for um new listeners potentially listening to this uh thanks for joining me on the program but the way that i usually like to frame these conversations is that uh it's often inspired by like recent news that has uh happened uh, in regards to like you know film or uh, in this case video games and i'm doing this uh i'm having this conversation in the context of i believe it was like uh the time of this recording it was like a, a little while ago we had the and granted it's weird if you're hearing this from me of all people but we had the announcement that heihachi was going to be the next dlc character for tekken 8 um and uh a little bit before that we also had the release of m bison for um street fighter 6 uh so I guess I kind of want to start this conversation focusing on like Heihachi because he's the one that kind of, you know, inspired me to want to like talk about this topic. But uh, so, yeah, during Evo, we had the announcement that Heihachi is going to come out. I believe uh, I don't think they gave us a specific date for him. It, they said just general autumn. So I would imagine maybe uh, early to mid September, if I had to guess, I mean. I don't know, maybe they could push into October, but I think that would be a little weird. Like, that would be, like, a long time between the release of Lydia to, like, him, I think. And, um, but, okay, so Heihachi was announced, and for the most part, a lot of people, admittedly, including myself, uh, we were very, we, well, are very hyped, right? Uh, uh, it's kind of a... At least uh, for me personally, Heihachi is like my favorite of the. I I can't remember what the fight the fighting style is called uh, in Tekken, but it's. Uh, I I guess I'll call it like the Mishima archetype. If you if you're a Tekken player, you you know what I'm talking about. Like you know they share like Electric God Fist or what have you. Um, but yeah, he's like my favorite of that type of like you know general. Uh, tr archetype or trope or whatever uh and um so while while i am hyped and i am really curious to see like how he plays and how he is integrated into tekken 8 i like a lot of other people am very conf was uh, was kind of like shocked and in some ways not necessarily a good way to hear that he's coming back um so for some background when tekken 8 was launched you know, they uh, obviously they did like the developer eh, developer interviews and what have you. And like the general consensus from the developers, like their general messaging was like, oh, yeah, Heiachi is like dead. We are not bringing him back. We are not doing anything like that. We are moving forward with this franchise with the assumption that like Heihachi is dead. And um uh, and you could kind of see that in how they designed a lot of not only the gameplay elements but also um how they approached like the actual story of it which kind of makes Heihachi's inclusion a bit cumbered like a bit clunky now so from a gameplay standpoint again they're we're kind of going with this assumption that like okay Heihachi is dead so the like kind of trade-off that they went with was that okay we'll take like heihachi's general game plan in particular like his moves like his normals and what have you and we'll kind of dissolve it into other members of the cast so the biggest example is the introduction of reina 
into Tekken 8 and how uh, she basically kind of takes one for one. I, I can't remember the YouTuber. I think it was like Chaos Productions Inc. did a video where you could see the side-by-side -side compar eh, comparison of, uh, you know, the normals that Reyna has in comparison to Heihachi and like how, how much, you know, Heihachi inspired her design. Not to say that she isn't like her own unique character, granted, she does have some things that are unique to her, but for the most part, I think she was very much presented as like, well, you know, for people who played Heihachi in the past, this is probably the character you'd most likely want to move over to. And for the most part, people were kind of like, okay with that, right? Like, Reyna is a very cool character. She has like a very cool design. I think she plays like, um, kind of an interesting role, uh, in the Tekken 8 story, especially towards the end, but I'll I'll get that I'll get to that a, like a, a little bit later. But for the most part, people are very hyped for it. Uh, I I think she's not the only one. I think Kuma um also kind of absorbed some of Heihachi's moves. I'm not I'm not exactly sure, but like for the most part, like they like I said, they took Heihachi, kind of dissolved them into some of the other characters. So. I guess the concern I have, and maybe some other people also have kind of this concern too, is that with this kind of design approach to some of the characters, will Heihachi feel redundant in his like game plan and his design? Now, I'm not sure if that's the case. Like modern fighting games are really good at taking you know general archetypes, i.e., like uh, Shoto's from. Street Fighter and making each one play like very distinctively from one another. This hasn't been a problem in like a long time. Uh, like for Street Fighter Six, for you know, for example, there's a reason why Ken is a much higher tier than like Ryu. I mean, granted, I haven't been checking. I haven't been keeping up with tier lists. Maybe like the gap has kind of closed because they know more people have like kind of embraced Ryu, but. For the most part, like even within these general fighting types in these games, there is enough variance between different fighters. So it so it isn't really like that much of um. So I'm not I'm really I'm not really too concerned about like you know well will Heihachi play differently enough, especially since at the as at the time of this recording we have like no gameplay for Heihachi. So what I'm saying is just pure speculation, but it does kind of create this design awkwardness where like okay now how do we approach heihachi to make him like distinct enough knowing that we kind of again did that like spreading out his moves to other characters um so that's from a gameplay perspective now from a story perspective um it's you kind of get and again this is more for my older viewers if you listen to like my recent episode covering like Hideo Kojima and like Death Stranding 2 and what have you you get kind of a similar situation to like Higgs where you know Tekken 7 was very much Heihachi's game especially with a single player story it was very much like as a means to kind of like finish at least the way that I interpret it, a means to like finish his arc within like the Tekken universe, right? And it was it was a great it was a great mode. I thought it was a great like you know um, story. I I liked the how it kind of laid the foundation for like a lot of the story beats that would be embraced in Tekken Eight. And no, I thought it was great. So now with bringing Heihachi back it's like again we're brought to the same situation where it's uh d it does it kind of diminish the events of like the previous game like oh the great he's back yes uh yay you know um now i don't want to i mean this is going to be a little bit of a spoiler so if you don't want to get spoiled for like the ending of Tekken 8 just skip like one or two minutes at this point i mean it's not like a huge spoiler but you know just in case like from here skip one or two minutes but tekken 8 basically ended with uh, for those of you who haven't played the single player story it ended with uh at least the good ending ended with uh the presumed death of kazuya but again with tekken and what we just seen with Heihachi, like nobody ever really stays dead in this world. But for the most part, 
at least currently, Kazuya is presumed like dead or at least taken out of commission. Right. And so I guess what will be kind of interesting, I, I, I mean, is maybe to see um, like, okay, now we have Heihachi without Kazuya because like one of Heihachi's kind of goals in the Tekken series was like hunting Kazuya because of, you know, the devil gene. Right, so now that he doesn't have to do that anymore, like, what's his what's his story? Like, what is he going to be doing? So that might be kind of interesting, and maybe they kind of implied some of that uh, in his uh, actual trailer. Um, unless I'm misreading something. Uh, again, we also have the inclusion of Reyna, which, uh, again, at the end of uh, Tekken 8's story, they're kind of leaning into... Uh, her potentially being like the main villain or that maybe they're going to pivot into her being kind of like that antagonizing force potentially leading into uh you know the the dlc story update that they're going to do for tekken 8 and possibly into like tekken 9 and onwards so seeing an interaction between like heihachi and uh in Reina might be interesting, but uh, again, I don't know. We're kind of working off of, uh, we're still working off of kind of speculation here, but um, so I, so I'm kind of mixed. Like, I guess I do want to give them the benefit of the doubt, and that maybe they will do something interesting with Heihachi, you know, post Tekken 7, but Tekken 7 was just such a good end to Heihachi's story that it feels like you know, Part of the re- like the only reason why he's being he's being brought back is because like you know rightfully from the developers he will like sell I think more like like his DLC will sell pretty well because you know he is a, a character that a lot of people like wanted to see come back but I I don't know like it's like one of those situations where it's like the the business side of like you know the potential value he'll bring as a DLC character in terms of sales versus like the storytelling elements of it. And I just don't know how much of it was deliberate. I I think there was an interview where they were kind of implying like, Oh, initially we didn't want to bring him back, but they, they kind of like from fan reaction, there was like, some people were like, I, I guess they kind of ran into, well, he's really popular. So they figured might as well. Right. But that's from um, the Tekken side of things. Now, on the on the flip side, we have uh, the game that I probably that I played more than Tekken. Obviously, you're watching gameplay of it right now. Is uh, well, if you're watching this in video format, podcast available in video format. Uh, is Street Fighter and the latest DLC character that was released for um, that game was M. Bison, which was also kind of in a similar situation. It was presumed in the last game that he was, uh, I, I believe, killed off in the story that he, that, you know, it was, there was some questions as to whether or not he was coming back. Um, but no, he is back. Uh, now with Street Fighter, it's a little bit different for a few reasons. Like gameplay wise, there was no character that they introduced to kind of replace M. Bison's fighting style in the way that they did uh Heihachi to Reina. You know, uh if if you were an M. Bison fan in five, there was really like no character that you could necessarily directly pivot to in the way that I think they kind of did with again Heihachi to Reina or what have you. So, in, in that regard, I, I guess there's kind of more of a justification. You could argue there's more of a justification for bringing back M. Bison than there is a justification for, um, you know, bringing back Heihachi. And in the story, I, I haven't been keeping too much with uh, M. Bison, M. Bison's story in Street Fighter Six. From my understanding, it could be implied that maybe it's like a clone and not really the original M. Bison. It's just, it's like a clone, but it just so happens, but it just so happens that this clone has like similar ambitions to like the original M. Bison or something like that. It's just like, you know, they wanted, you know, they did like the cop out version of like bringing back M. Bison without like, you know, wanting to like diminish the story of like five or whatever. But, um, yeah, when 
bringing back M. Bison was, uh, and a lot of other people in the fan base have, were like in the FGC broadly have kind of pointed out how it was, it isn't, it wasn't received as positively as like the announcement of Heihachi coming back. And I think the, which is to me kind of weird because I do like M. Bison. Granted, I, I eventually didn't pick him up for Street Fighter Six because I can't really get behind his like game plan. You know, I'm just stuck too much on Akuma. I just think Akuma is so much fun. Um, but uh, yeah. So I I I pers- but I do personally like. I think conceptually, M. Bison. I thought you know I always thought he was kind of a cool character, even when I was like more of a scrubby player. I picked him up every now and then, or what have you. Um. But, uh, yeah, and I think, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought there. But no, no, I, like, I did like M. Bison more, and I thought, um, but I think, I think the reason why a lot of people might be um, kind of annoyed at M. Bison coming back is, uh, well, at least one of the reasons why I'm kind of, while I do like M. Bison, I think it is weird to bring it back, is that Street Fighter Six's story, at least the way that I kind of interpret it, because uh, I haven't really had a chance to play the World Tour mode, but the way that I've kind of interpreted the story is that, you know, it exists like, okay, this is a world post like Shadowloo. Like some of the Shadowloo members still exist but Shadowloo isn't as prominent as it was in like previous games so like the way that fighting is kind of approached in like the in the canon of Street Fighter 6 is that people are now just fighting for the sake for the love of fighting right they're doing it because they have like a passion for like you know holding their like you know their martial arts kind of in like the way that we do like competitions with um you know, like judo or like any like combat sport or what have you. It's kind of like a similar approach here, except like everyone is into it. It's like society is structured around like everyone loving to fight. Right. And I I kind of love that approach. Like, oh, there's no really big bad villain. It's just these, you know, fighters just chilling and just, you know, um, yeah, engaging in like, uh, you know, friendly competition between each other. So, like, with the introduction of Shadowloo, they're also kind of leaning that, like, oh, uh, or I'm sorry, with the reintroduction of, like, M. Bison, it's also implying that, like, they're wanting to bring back, like, Shadowloo and, again, do the whole arc of Shadowloo being the big villain that everyone kind of has to, like, so in some cases directly, some cases indirectly, like, you know, fight. Um... And I could kind of see that. There's also some people that were saying that, you know, um, with the death of M. Bison, they should have kind of pivoted more towards Gil being um, the main villain because I think, like, with the uh, with the timeline of Street Fighter, I, can't, I, I think 6 takes place after, like, 3 or something. I can't remember, like, the exact order of the uh, Street Fighter games. Um, you know in terms of like when, which one is supposed to be taking place when or what have you. But um yeah, so I, I can also kind of see that too because uh I also think Gil's like kind of a really cool character and it does feel like kind of weird backpedaling to you know to potentially have like M. Bison and Shadowloo be like the villains again. But we'll have to see how it pans out. Um and so yeah, as as you could see there's kind of like, you know, this, I think, kind of... I don't know if I would go as far as to say, like, an issue. But kind of this sort of dilemma of, like, you know... Uh, these stories clearly want to kind of pro- like kind of progress in terms of, like, you know... I guess their linearity and, like, you know, completing characters' arcs and what have you. But uh, you kind of run into the conflict of, obviously... Well, a lot of these characters are, like, fan favorites. And... Sometimes it's not as easy as just, uh, oh, well, we could just introduce a new character that has this character's, like, fighting style because that has been done to, like, mixed results in the past. Um, for, for like, a modern example, you could take, like, uh, Lily in Street Fighter Six, how she is kind of this, um, 
not wholly a replacement for T Hawk, but there's again like T Hawk was kind of dissolved into like Lily, and for the most part, people are like fine with that. Like you know, Lily isn't insanely a fan favorite. I like I'm sure she has like some people that really do like her, but you know. I think why that like people are more okay with like T Hawk, you know, Thunderhawk being replaced in Street Fighter is that, you know, um again there were some people that played Thunderhawk, but I don't think he was like a huge fan favorite character, so it's like kind of I I guess more okay to replace him. But it would be kind of weird to replace like M. Bison because he is more liked. So yeah, it's not like you could just take everyone in like a fighting game roster and then just replace them with a younger version of the character and people will be okay with that because uh conversely they tried doing that in um like Soul Calibur. I think there was like a Soul Calibur entry in which they tried to replace like Taki with like a younger ninja and people just did not like that at all. Um I think, like, Street Fighter 3, like, the first rendition of the game barely had any of, like, the original Road Warriors, and it was, like, met with, like, a lot of flack for that reason. Um, and again, they tried, in Street Fighter 3, they also tried doing this, uh, the same thing, like, uh, Remy kind of being, like, the stand-in for, like, Guile and, like, what have you. Um, so you can't necessarily just go the route of, like, replacing the old roster with, like, new characters, because I think beyond, like, a character's functions, there is clearly, um, you know, people do become attached to the, like, to the characters outside of just their moves, like, because, you know, their design kind of influences, like, their personality, you know, in the game, while you're playing the game. And, uh, you know, and a character's personality does also, like, you know, other people have done, like, you know, entire, like, essays on this topic, but, like, you know, a character's design does influence, um, you know, how they're, how they're, you know, their approach in terms of, like, their gameplay, how their gameplay is, like, designed and what have you. Um, so, okay, so we can't just replace these aging characters with like newer versions of themselves you can in some cases but for the most part it's much harder to do so okay we want to so from like a game developer perspective okay we want to embrace embrace like this linearity in our storytelling we want to have like these characters go through these arcs and you know convey these arcs in like a single player story but um so so what do we do and different fighting games have had like different you know solutions to it uh, some games like soul caliber have gone with like uh, like kind of just doing like uh with later entries kind of a, i don't know what the term would be not quite like a recon but like um like a remake where basically they pull the time back on like the timeline where okay this game will take place like earlier in the timeline so that way it doesn't you know we don't have to worry about like aging characters or what have you um, you can take the more extreme example of like Mortal Kombat where it's like, okay, we'll just completely reset the timeline. So um, now it's like, you know, we take these characters back, but like different events have been, you know, have played out instead. And that has its own issues in the sense that like, well, for me personally, I just find like, it's just completely sucked me out of Mortal Kombat storytelling. Like basically now there's like three different timelines. And, like, any time, like, they're basically kind of stuck in a corner of, like, oh, man, you know, this current timeline has reached, like, a cataclysmic, apocalyptic, like, event. Let's just reset the, let's just, you know, reset the timeline and we'll just tell it all over again. You know, it's kind of hard to build, like, a constant, um, I guess, I engagement in that regard, I think, with a story. If it's just, like, oh, it'll just be reset in the next game directly um i think uh i think ko i think like well i mean older kof games i think back when it had like a yearly release also kind of had like you know again this thing of like one game leading into the next but like for back in those back in those games they didn't really acknowledge the characters ages so you just assumed that i mean they might have with like a character bio but it wasn't like again because storytelling wasn't taken 
uh, fighting game storytelling wasn't taken as seriously back then as you know it kind of is now at least with like the single player concept of it um you know you could be like kind of more nebulous with like the depiction of like these these characters in terms of their ages but you know like in street fighter we do see these characters like getting older and they you know there's like a you you are drawn to like the fact that like ryu is much older now than he was in like definitely like street fighter 2 to be sure so i i don't know if you could just like completely ignore like these characters getting older especially since like you know we've we've gone this far with like kind of you know especially since street fighter is like trying to establish this timeline so i'm i'm not sure what the when necessarily the solution is to this problem necessarily like i i don't think people want to go back to where like there is no like like story like where it's just treating these games as just like uh just you know not not having like a single player story in these games because you know the single player modes do bring a lot of people into these games like a lot of people like casual audience into these games are kind of invested in them because they want to see like where the story develops especially with like tekken absolutely so i'm i'm not sure what's necessarily the solution is i mean maybe it might like granted maybe it might not be that much of an issue maybe it's just we'll just accept that like you know uh fighting games have like you know comic book logic where like nobody really stays dead like anybody can come back due to like um whatever but i i know like comic books a lot of people don't like that about like you know that medium because it, it kind of you kind of run into like the similar problems um I don't know. It's I guess it's just kind of an interesting thing to like think about, and that, and that was just mainly the crux of why I wanted to do this video was kind of like, you know, I guess organizing my own thoughts into like how like I don't know like how do you like solve this, but how it can be approached, and um, yeah, I guess I guess nonetheless, I am very, I'm still, I am very curious to see where these stories go i just hope they don't like abuse like characters dying and then coming back for the sake of like just dlc i mean the only other thing that i can think of is um i i mean i th i thought what they were going to do with like tekken just as, as a, like a final last point for myself is that they were just going to treat like uh heihachi coming back as like a like what if you know like uh oh what if he had survived and maybe they no i don't think they will because you know he is coming alongside uh like i think the um the story dlc it is implying again we haven't like really seen the story dlc so maybe i'm wrong but it's implied that he's gonna be playing a huge part in that so i think he is like within the the, the context of the lore he is coming back but like maybe it would be cool for like future games to just treat DLC as like like interesting what if scenarios. Maybe that might be cool. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I um I I guess that's just basically my piece on the topic. But uh yeah, thank you all so much for joining me and uh. I don't know, remember to drink your Ovaltine or something. Later.